Uh, let's everybody in the house put our hands together and clap unto the Lord. Uh, hallelujah, Jesus. Uh, hallelujah, Jesus. Uh, hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, uh, let's add our voices with that and clap. We love you, Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Let's worship the Lord for just a moment longer. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Lord Jesus. That's it, just use your voice. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Lord Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen, amen. I feel like I have a word for you uh, this morning. And I feel like that there are people uh, in this congregation and in this assembly that are facing the same issue. It's not a new issue. In fact, it's an old issue. You've been around this mountain before. It's the same giant. It's the same problem. It's not new. And I feel like the Lord would have us push beyond that so that we can go beyond to where God is leading us collectively and where God is leading us individually. Because it's the enemy's job to keep us where we are. It's his job to hinder us from doing what God wants us to do and where he wants us to go. That's his job, and he does a good job at it. But I'm here to tell you this morning that we have power and we have authority to push through every hindrance, every wall, every barrier, every giant, every Red Sea we can cross. We can cross Jordan. We can take Jericho. Whatever it is God has for us, we can do it with the power of the Holy Ghost and knowledge of the Word of God. Hallelujah. My people are destroyed for a lack of inspiration. My people are destroyed for lack of good services. My people are destroyed for lack of good music. Good preaching. Good fellowship. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. The knowledge of what? Of the Word of God. And as long as you're ignorant of the Word of God, you will not see the benefits that God has promised you. Hallelujah. The scripture said he daily loads us with benefits and blessings, but you have got to know what those benefits and blessings are to get. Let me tell you something. I got a job, and there are benefits that are given to me, health insurance, life insurance, things that they pay for me. And they give us a book every year. Now, one thing the Bible doesn't do, it doesn't change, but our book at work, it changes every year. All right? But if I have a need, all I have to do is get that book out and look through there and to see what's covered and what's not covered. And if it's covered, you better be rest assured that I'm going to call and, and make sure those benefits are enacted. And I am able to receive those benefits that are due to me because I work at that place. Let me tell you something. When you work for God and you live for God, there are certain benefits and there are certain things that are entitled to you as a believer. That you don't have to suffer through some things because the God, the word of the Lord says that you have power and authority and dominion over certain things. Oh, hallelujah. And we've been circling around the same mountain for way too long. And we've been facing the same giant and facing the same red seats for way too long. Hallelujah. Been praying about the same things for way too long. And I feel like I have a word from the Lord for you this morning. You may be seated. 
There comes a time in every believer's life that your faith will come under scrutiny. You will face a test of faith. If you've lived for God for 15 minutes or 50 years or 115 years, you can rest assured if you've never had a test of your faith, it's coming. It's just a part of life. Life will make sure that you're tested in your stand for faith. The accuser of the brethren will make sure that you are tested. And yes, the accuser of the brethren uses people to accuse. I'm often amused at people that say they live for God, but they're never loving and kind to the people of God or to the things of God. And they always take the stance of the accuser of the brethren. Well, let me tell you something. If you act like the devil and you're accusing the people of God, I'm going to tell you, your fruit is betraying you if you're saying you're a Christian and you're accusing the brethren and you're accusing the church. You're not where you're supposed to be in God. And if you're so perfect, why don't you show us how it's done? Hello, hallelujah, amen, glory to God, thank you, Jesus. Amen. And the accuser of the brethren will make sure that your faith is tested and tried. Now buckle your seatbelt. Even God will allow you to be tested. He does not tempt anyone. He doesn't put you in a situation where you're going to fail. He always makes a way of escape, but there is a testing period. There is a time when God will put you between a rock and a hard place and say, okay, what are you going to do? You've been saying one thing, but what are you going to do now that you're in this situation? You've told me that you're going to pay tithe and be faithful. Now you've got 29 bills due and more, and the mailman's at your box now. And money's out, and bills are due. What are you going to do? Are you going to pay your tithe, or are you going to falter? Oh, come on, I'm, I'm hitting where the rubber meets the road. We can't just talk it, we've got to walk it. You've got to work that faith. And God will allow things to come in your life to put you in a tight position, to see what you're made of, to see what you're going to do, to see if you're really believing what you're saying you're believing. If we believe that the scriptures are true, and I believe that we do, then we know that God has our best interest in mind. David said in Psalm 37 and 23, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. So why are you fretting? Why are you questioning God about the steps and the path and the situation that you're in? If your steps are ordered by the Lord, then you're where you're supposed to be. I didn't say we liked it. Didn't say all things were good. Said all things work together for good. Oh, hallelujah. I've heard people say, oh, it's all good. It ain't all good. If it is, then I want what you've got because it ain't all good in my life. Come on now. That's a lie from the pit. It ain't all good. Don't it's all good. It ain't all good. It's there's some of it that's bad. And some of it's ugly. But all things work together for good. If you allow God to use you and you'll stick to your faith, God will work that situation around for the good. And if for no other reason it's for you to help somebody else that's going through that same situation. God will allow these things to come and he has ordered your steps. You say, well, I don't know, Elder, you're, you're kind of... You're kind of pushing some things there because God is good and God is all about love and God is always good and just wonderful and just, you know, peaches and cream, bed of roses. And, that's, and, that's, and he is. He is good. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. But if you think he's not going to put you in a situation, there used to be an old song that says, I would never, how would you know God was a healer unless you'd ever been sick? How would you ever know God would help you with your money if you weren't in a situation? Or you were in a bad shape. There are situations that are God-ordained. You think, well, I don't know, Elder. I'm not sure if you're in the book or not. Well, just ask the children of Israel. 
I'm going to bring you out of Egypt with a high hand, and I'm going to lead you into the land that I will show you. And he's taking them to the promised land. And you know what? Next thing you know, the Red Sea's in front of them. All right, that, that's, that's pretty bad. To the left, there's a mountain. To the other side, they're caught. It's a U shape. Well, the devil knows that I'm just, he's going to leave me alone now because he knows we're the people of God and he's just going to rest and he's not coming. No, Pharaoh was hot on their trail and they were boxed in. It was God ordained for them to be boxed in. The problem is the children of Israel stopped. The problem with you and I is we stopped. I don't ever read in the scripture where the Lord said, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. He never said stop. We are always to go forward. And I hope I got your attention because I can tell I did. He never said it. Moses said, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. What he did not mean is what we interpret it to mean. I'm going to stand here and I'm going to wait. I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to have a praise in my lips. I'm not going to have a clapping in my hands or a dance in my feet. I'm just going to sit and wait on God. I'm going to stand here and do nothing. That is not the will of God. It has never been the will of God. It's not the will of God for the North Charleston Church. It's not the will of God for your individual life to stand still and do nothing. We are always called to move forward in God. children of Israel had to make a decision because if you stand still and you stop you're going to die you'll be enslaved again by Pharaoh and not only that but he'll kill you you got away once you ain't getting away this time hallelujah hallelujah there's a parable about the house being swept clean and the devil's cast out what happens next you leave that open what's going to happen all that one's going to come back no he's going to get six of his buddies Seven of them going to come. You, you thought you got away once. You're not going to get away the second time. You've got to constantly be moving forward in your walk with God. I've heard people say that the Bible is a book of destiny. And I believe that. But it is also a book of decisions. Because I'm here to tell you that decisions are what determines your destiny. The scripture says in Deuteronomy, I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, therefore choose life. The Lord said, I'm going to give you a test. There's only two ways that I'm going to ask you, which way are you going to go? But I'm going to give you a little hint. I'm going to give you the God's test for dummies. And look it up in that book. And you know what it's going to say? Choose life. I'm going to give you a hint. Give you a little footnote here. Choose life. You're going to choose death or life. Come on. What's your decision? Choose life. Why would you go through life and choose death? Why do people in trouble always run from God? Why do people in trouble... Always run from God. Why do people, when they sin, why do you run from God? You need to run to God and not from God. I've been in a lot of situations. That old song, if I ever did need the Lord before, I sure do need him now. Let me tell you something. Why in trouble would I forsake the Lord and get all mad and bent out of shape and say, God, I don't know what's going on. I'm going to trust to believe and I'm going to trust in life. Many things that I don't understand. Come on, folks. We live in a real world. There are a lot of things that happen that I don't understand. I don't have an answer to. Oh, hallelujah. There are things that happened to me this year that I have no answer to. Come on. But you can't run from God. You run to God. Yes, sir. We've, 
got to move forward. It's not a time to back up and to quit. Can I make heads or tails of everything? No, I can't make heads or tails of everything. I don't know. And there are no answers. I, I think there's some answers we'll never get until we get there. But I am determined. More than ever in 2016, I've had a lot of loss this year. And I got a loved one that's dying right now. Possibly just days to live. I cannot afford to run from God. He is my help. He is my strength. And I must move forward in God. Do I understand why? Do I understand what's going to happen? Can I put it all together? No. But I do know he has my best interest in mind. And I do know that I've got to move forward. You've got to choose this day, Joshua said, who you're going to serve. I'm not just a fair weather friend of God. When things get tough, I'm going to up and leave him. I'm married to him. I have a covenant. That's what a covenant is. I'm, I'm, I'm covenant with God. I cannot leave. And this garbage about nowadays, well, you just, you like you go into the shoe store, you try a pair on. If you don't like them, take them back and get another pair with marriage and everything else in life. That's not the way it is. When the feeling is not there, that's when love kicks in. Well, I thought love was a feeling. No, love is a commitment. I am committed. I'm committed to God. I've decided to follow Jesus. There is no other option. In every decision, we have a decision to make. Am I going to believe God? Am I going to trust God? Am I going to run to Him? Or am I not going to believe God and not trust God and blame God? And I know that it sounds easy when you're sitting on a pew and you're amen and somebody says, that's right, I believe God, I trust God. But when something arises in your life that hits you broadside, that you were not expecting, that you did not see coming, you did not believe God would allow you to go through that. It's another thing to say, I still believe God. I do choose to believe the Lord. And you're posed with a question at every situation in your life. Are you going to believe God? Or are you not going to believe God? And that decision in that moment. Is going to determine your destiny. I must say that it's not just the big decisions. Or the decisions that you face. When you're facing a difficult or a big problem. That make a difference in your life. It's small decisions. Every day. Life is made up of small decisions. Every day. And those decisions also shape your destiny. Lord, it's 11 o'clock. I've worked all day. I'm tired. Do I read my Bible? Or I just go to sleep. Lord, I'm, 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 I'm in a rush. The alarm went off. I hit snooze. I'm running late. I don't have time to pray. Do I take a moment to pray or take time to pray? Or do I just rush out the door and just give me a lick and a promise and go out the door and go on? Do I witness to that? co-worker or do I just let the opportunity pass? Do I pray throughout the day, pray without ceasing, constantly have a mind of prayer? Do, do I, you know, and it works in every situation of your life. A man told me one time he had met a friend of his that had lost over 100 pounds and he said, man, what did you do? He said, well, it wasn't nothing big. He said, well, it had to be big because you lost 100 pounds. What did you do? He said, just a lot of small decisions every day. When I went to lunch, it was grilled chicken instead of fried salad instead of french fries oh sure that first day that didn't mean a whole that didn't mean a whole lot grilled chicken and, and a salad but every day i made better decisions and he said i lost a hundred pounds 
And sometimes we're praying, God, I want to lose 100 pounds. And I'm just using that as an example. God, I want this thing situated. And I want this everything just worked out perfectly. But we make the wrong decisions every day. Just little tiny wrong decisions that shape our destiny. Once the children of Israel decided that we're going to believe God. Moses raised his staff in the Red Sea part and they walked across on dry ground. And the very water that parted for them was the same water that came crashing in on Pharaoh's army and drowned every one of them. It was a twofold miracle. God will make a way for you and at the same time destroy the enemy that's on your trail with the same water. Oh, hallelujah. What's deliverance for one can be destruction for another. It's all in your decision making. It's always God's will to move forward. We are never supposed to stop moving forward. Never supposed to stand still. You said, now wait a minute, you, you said that a few minutes ago and you kind of glazed over it. And, but I remember Exodus 14 and 13, it says, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And I remember 2 Chronicles chapter 20, it says, stand, see, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. So if you'll study those out, what that means is stand strong. Stand strong in your faith. It doesn't mean do nothing. Stand strong. New Testament says this way, let us hold fast. The profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Stand strong, hold fast, but continue to move forward. We used to sing a song a long time ago. I'm going through. I don't care what the rest of the world decides to do. I've made up my mind. I'm not going to turn around. I'm going through with Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm holding through his nail-scarred hand. I'm going through. I'm not staying here. I am not staying in the situation I am in. I will not stay. I would like to draw your attention to an Old Testament story. One of my favorite characters in the whole Bible. He's one of my favorite because he does... He did what I said we should do, and that is run to God instead of from God. This man made several mistakes, and more than just mistakes, he had several sins in his life. I'm talking what we would consider the big ones. I'm talking like adultery. I'm talking murder. I'm talking some big, big things. And yet the scripture says that he was a man after God's own heart. How can a murderer and an adulterous man be a man after God's own heart? Because he ran to God, not from him. And we as a church are to allow people to run to God and not from God. Imagine with me, 1 Samuel chapter 17. The Philistines and the people of God. People of God are on one mountain. The Philistines are on the other mountain. And they're ready to fight. We're going to duke it out. We're going to have it out. And the scripture says they're fighting. And they're battling. And then all of a sudden, seemingly out of nowhere, this gargantuan of a warrior over nine feet tall steps forward and challenges the army of the Lord. And every day, twice a day for over a month, 40 days, this big dude of a warrior, I'm talking not over nine feet tall, and the scripture de de describes all of his armor. I mean everything. Heavy, duty, dude. Experienced warrior. And when I tell my children the story, Isaiah loved the story. And so I always say, he'd, I'd say, Goliath stepped out and he'd say, who will fight me? 
He loved that part. Say it again, Dad. Who will fight me? And that's what he said. Who's going to fight me? Now, if you send someone out, send me a man, which I love this, kind of got smart. Like, you got a man, send him over here. Not a boy, not somebody who thinks he's a man. You've got a man, send a man out to me. And if, you know, when we fight, if you win, if this man wins and he beats me, then we will serve you. And if I beat him, then you will serve us. Well, Israel was just like, here we go again. We get to the point, we get to the battle, and all of a sudden we, uh, uh, wait, there's, oh, whoa, whoa, there's Goliath. There is the man of Gath. Man, he is, ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I'm okay with a guy my size, my build, man. I can take him, man. I think, I, I mean, you know, I don't know. I've been looking, sizing him up, looking at his muscles. I think I can do it. I'm a little bit better with the sword with him, than him, and I, my feet are a little bit faster, you know. My punch is just a little bit, you know, he, he got to watch out for that left, and I, I think I could take him. But nine foot guy, man, I don't know. And they stopped. They didn't move forward. Forty days they were stymied and just waiting and thinking, what are we going to do? We're, we're afraid. And every time Goliath would come out, they'd run back and go, oh, no, we can't. We can fight those guys, but we can't fight him. And what are we going to do? And he was taunting the people of God. There was a man named Jesse, and he had eight sons. And three of his eldest sons, Eliab, Abinadab, and Shammah, went to fight with Saul. One day he called his youngest son and uh, said, David, I want you to go and uh, stop. You're not going to keep the sheep today. I want you to take some food to your brothers. And not only that, I want you to take some cheese to their captain of a thousand. And I want to see how they're faring. I want you to ask them how they're doing. Get a what's going on and then come back and tell me. I want to know what's going on. It's my boys out there. I want to know what's going on. No internet, no TV, no live coverage. I mean, so he, he wanted to know what's going on. I mean, what's happening? Are we, are we getting whipped? Are we beating them? Are we making progress? I mean, are they hungry? Are, are, what's going on? We, and I, gotta, I wanna help their captain make sure that he's, he's got enough cheese and, and he's got enough food so he's thinking clearly because he's leading my, there's three of my boys out there that he's, he's over and he's responsible for. And I, I wanna make sure they come home and I wanna send my youngest boy out there to, to go. And so he, sends David out and I want you to go up there and then I want you to come back and tell me what's going on and just about the time he gets there and he he gets uh, he gives the the guy the, the chariot and he sits there and waits and he gives the food to his brothers how you doing saluting them and he goes up and gives the cheese to the captain he's doing all this stuff and he's talking hey how you doing how's it going what's going on you know I mean guys did you take out and what happened here and this and that and you got a bruise here and you got a cut here what happened and, and just about time he's getting all what's going down The gargantuan nine-foot giant comes out and he's like, who will fight me? And young, inexperienced David, he's not even in the army. He keeps the sheep. He's not even in training. He's not even in the backup army. He's not even second string in the army. If there is a second string or a third string, you know, we're going to send the first guys out, you know, and then we'll, when we down to nothing, we're going to send you. He wasn't even part of that. He's kind of like the guy, you know, over here, I'll do it. You know, I'll play dodgeball. I, uh, go home, David. I was there, too. I was one of those ones. Like, oh, well, I guess we'll take Garrett. Come on. It's real uh, fun to play dodgeball at recess when you're the last guy picked. And that's the way David was. He said, just go home. And wait a minute, wait a minute. Is there not a cause? I cannot believe that I'm just inexperienced. And I come up and I can't believe your captain, the king, my three brothers, and every one of you guys. I looked up to you all, and I thought you guys were strong and mighty and willing to fight and do something for God, and, and I can't believe that there's, there's a cause here. 
Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he doesn't have a covenant with God? He's not protected. We have the covenant of God. We have the name of God. We have the word of God. And, and we can take this man out. Who does he think he is? And he defies the armies of the living God. David knew who he was. And the problem with us, because we're going around the same mountain, facing the same giant, facing the same seas, because we don't know who we are. And it's the devil's job to keep you in ignorance so you don't know who you are. You are a believer. You're anointed by God. You're filled with the Holy Ghost, baptized in the You have a covenant with the living God. You have protection and provision and deliverance. And whatever you need from God, you can have it because you are a believer. You are a child of God. You have to have that knowledge of who you are in God. In other words, I don't have to take this. Do you know who I am? I'm not talking about being arrogant. I'm talking about knowing who you are in Christ. I don't have to take this. Number one, you've got to have faith in God. You've got to know who you are, but you've got to know who God is. You've got to have faith in God and magnify God and not the problem. The scripture says, oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and he delivered. You can't make God bigger. You can't do it. You can't make God smaller. God is God. He is who he is. You can't make him bigger. So why did the writer say, oh, magnify the Lord? Because he said, make him bigger in your situation. Don't magnify the problem. You make God bigger in your life. You make God bigger in your situation. You make God bigger in every area of your life. I'm magnifying God. I'm allowing him to be bigger in my life, bigger in my situation, bigger in my circumstances. I'm allowing him to be bigger. That's why I say I will magnify the Lord and let us exalt his name together. Because if you seek him, he will deliver you. Magnify God and not the problem. Number two, don't listen to the negative. The fearful and the unbelieving will try to stop you. David, you're too young. You can't do it. We're scared to death. We're scared to death for, our, for, for ourselves. We're scared to death for you to go out there too. We, just don't do that. Don't step out there, elder. Don't have faith like that. Don't say that. Don't say that out loud. I've heard people say stuff like that. Are you a believer? You don't sound like one. Don't, don't say that. You're going to incite a riot with the devil. You don't want that. Really? He don't know who I am. And here's the thing. When you start to realize this, and you say, well, you know, what if the devil takes you out and he kills you? He can't unless the Lord allows him. But even if the Lord allows him to kill me, I still win. Because you know what I'm going to be doing to him while I'm, when I die, if the Lord tarries and he allows me to die. You know what I'm going to be doing when I die? I love doing this. I know it's a little smart, Alec, but that's just, I love it. When I go up and my spirit's leaving this earth, I'm not even going to turn around and look. I'm just going to go, aha, I still win. I may, be, I may be dead, but I still win because I'm going to glory. I'm going to walk streets of gold. I'm going to see walls of jasper and gates of pearl. And most of all, I'm going to see Jesus. And you ain't going. And you can't get there because you ain't allowed to go there. Let me tell you something. We win. It's a win-win situation. Whether I live or whether I die, I belong to God. Oh, hallelujah. We've got to realize who we are. And don't listen to the fearful and unbelieving. Buckle your seatbelt again. Church people got angry with him. His brethren said, you're naughty. You're up to no good. You're causing trouble. You should be home. God has called you to faithfulness. You need to be faithful to those sheep and faithful to our father Jesse. What are you doing here? You're naughty. You shouldn't be here. And they got mad at him. 
for trying to fix something that they were trying to fix. We don't know what to do. Well, I got the answer. No, 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 you go home. No, 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 I, no you just get out of here. Now, you, you go home. And they got mad at him. Then they said, well, somebody, the king got wind of it, so bring him here. And he said, well, you don't have enough experience. This is a boy. This is a youth. He can't fight Goliath. He's an experienced warrior. This is a young boy. You don't have enough experience. Go home. You're too young. Let me tell you something. Church people tell you too young to, live, to do something for God. Then when you get too old, or when they think you're too old, they'll say you're too old to do something for God. There's never a perfect age. I feel like I'm like kind of in the middle right now. But the young people think I'm too old, and then the old people think I'm too young yet. So I'm still in the same situation you are. You're either too young or too old. Let me tell you, there's no perfect age. You believe God no matter how old or how young you are. It's always amazing to me. You know, you, you read something in a paper. Job. Here's a job. Must have experience. Okay, well, if you're a young guy, how are you going to have experience? And there's 10 jobs you've got to have experience for. Somebody's got to give you time. And somebody's got to allow you to have that experience. So come on, David. You don't have the experience? Well, here's a good time to learn right now. Both feet. We don't have faith in you, David. You're not able to do this. And you know what you're doing because you look out there and you see Goliath and he's too strong for you. If you think you can whip him, and there is a lot of us army dudes here that have trained, we've got experience, we know how to use our weapons, and we can't whip him. How do you think you're going to whip him? The enemy's too big for you. He's going to take you out. Don't listen to the negative. But I'm going to tell you, when you stand in faith, Many times, if not all the time, you stand by yourself. Don't look for church people to pat you on the back. Don't look for family and friends to hold your hand and say, praise the Lord, brother. We're believing with you. A lot of times you stand by yourself. Because they think you're crazy. Come on now. They think you're dumb. He's simple in the head. There's no... Poor Elder Brian, he just, y'all pray for him because he just believe in God for some stuff and they just, you know, and here I am standing by myself. Here you are standing by yourself. You stand alone. Number three, when you're by yourself and people don't believe in you and you're just wearing you down, you look at Saul, you look at your brothers. You look at the unbelieving and the fearful, and you said, there was one time. I may not have the experience, but I'm going to tell you something. Let's have a little testimony service here. I know we don't have those a lot anymore for good reason, but we used to have testimony service when I was growing up. Because most of the time they started, oh, saints, Goliath is big, and he's strong, and he's over nine feet tall, and he's taunting us, saints, and I want you all to pray the Lord, help me make it through. Pray my strength in the Lord. And so we quit having testimony service. But what was supposed to happen is what David did. Saul, I know you don't think I'm big enough and I'm not man enough and I'm not experienced enough, but there was one time there was a lion. And I was entrusted with my father's sheep. I feel the Holy Ghost. I just had a little bit of sheep, and that's all I was supposed to do. But here came a lion, and he was going to take one of those lambs. And let me tell you, he grabbed it, took off, and I took off right after him. And I grabbed him by the mane, and I threw him down, and I slew him, and I took that ewe lamb out of his mouth. You don't think that's big enough? And then one time, I, another day, come along, here come a bear. And he did the same thing, and I took out running after that bear. And I slew that bear. And I'm going to tell you something, Saul. And I'm going to tell you something, my brothers. And I'm going to tell you something, church. I'm going to tell you something, unbelievers. God is the same God. If he helped me take care of the lion, he's going to help me take, and he take care of the bear. He's going to help me take care of Goliath. It will be just as good. Oh, hallelujah. You've got to rehearse past victories. 
and remember that what God has done for you. You say, well, I'm facing a giant, and everybody's telling me I can't do this, and I'm getting a little weary myself. But you say, oh, I remember one time when I prayed and God healed my body. I remember one time when I was seeking for the Holy Ghost, and he baptized me in the Holy Ghost. I remember one time when I was a sinner, and I had a lot of sins, and I needed them washed away. And the preacher preached, and I went up, and I went down in a watery grave. I remember one time when I was sick. I remember one time when I needed financial blessing. I remember you start rehearsing those things. And believe in God to do the miraculous. Rehearse past victories. Number four, I'm hurrying along. Be yourself. Stay with what you know. And be prepared. It's funny. Because once you make that stand of faith, and you're out there, and you're by yourself, and you're starting, you're starting to have a little church all by yourself. Huh? Hey, yeah, the lion. Oh, yeah, the bear. Oh, yeah, praise God. I'm going, and Goliath's going down. And the church people say, oh, bless him, Jesus. Bless him, Jesus. That's right. All right, well, we're not going to go, but let, let, let's give you a little advice. Let's help you. Come here, let me help you. A couple things. Number one, never take advice from a pauper about finances. If I'm going to take advice from somebody, I'll find, it, I'll find me a millionaire, billionaire. I want to talk to him. Now, that sounds so simple. But I've seen people take advice from people thinking, why in the world would you take advice from them? They can't even get their, they can't fight their way of a wet paper bag, and they're giving you battle advice. And they'll try to wait. Oh, we, okay, well, if you're insisting on going, then we're going to help you. Take this. Oh, oh, that's help. Oh, that's helping you, brother. Straighten up a little bit. Yeah, yeah, that, 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 that's helping you. Here, take this, take this big shield. Oh, 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 is that helping? Oh, yeah, that's helping you. You need that. You really need that. It's good. You can do that. Here's a big old sword. Here, take this. Oh, okay. This is helping. Oh, yeah, it's helping you. Go on, go on. Yeah, that, that sword's helping you. Okay, and you're saying you're like, okay, I, I, okay, I got the sword. Let me see. I got the sword. I got the, the shield. I got the helmet. I got, I got. Uh, breastplate, I got the feet shod. Okay, uh, 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 this is helping. Oh, yeah, it's helping. Go ahead. Go, go, get, go get him, tiger. Go get Goliath. Take him out. That's right. Go get him. We're helping you. You need this stuff. You need, you need this stuff. And that's what they do. They're going to help you fight the battle. And David said, wait a minute. I can't even walk. I can't even move. I have not proven these things. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get something what I know. I'm going to get something that I know I can use. I know how to use it. I've done it all my life, and I'm pretty good at it. So I'm just going to stick with what I know. And I'm going to grab my sling. I'm going to get five smooth stones. I'm going to put them in my bag, and I'm going to be ready. Now, I've heard a lot of sermons about why he had five smooth stones. Some people say, well, he's prepared in case the first one didn't take him out. Could be. I've heard other people say, well, he, uh, Goliath had four brothers, and he was ready for them to step forward, too. He's going to take them all out. I like the latter one better. The first one's going to take Goliath out, and if any of you other boys, come on. I'm going to take you all out right now. Come on. You got to so say something? Come on. I'm ready. I'm not backing down. Let's go. You going to say it? Say it now. People will put things on you that will only weigh you down and hinder your progress. Therefore, lay aside every weight and sin that does so easily beset you. And whatever is not of faith is sin, Romans says. So if I don't have the faith to use all that stuff you're helping me with, I'm going to shirk it, I'm going to get rid of it and take it off, and I'm going to use what I know. We can't stop you, David. Then we're going to weigh you down and try to get you to fight it man's way. This is the way we're going to do it. You have to use some reason. You know, faith, you're out there on a limb. Use some reason here. The carnal way. Do it the reasoning way or the car, what, what sounds good to everybody. Verse 45 says that David... Got rid of that too because he told 
Goliath. He said, you come to me in the physical. You come to me in the carnal. But I come to you in the name of the Lord. You might be bigger. You might be born, born bad and more experienced. You might have a lot more armor than I've got. But I've got something you don't have. And I've got the name of the Lord. And I come to you in the name of the Lord. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God. You might be fighting a lawsuit. And you may not be as smart as those lawyers and the judge and everybody involved. But you go in the name of the Lord and the Lord will give you a victory. Oh, hallelujah. You don't have to be the smartest or the best. You go in the name of the Lord. That's number five. Go in the name of the Lord and speak the word of God. What word do you speak? The word of the living God. How you want it to turn out. Uh Uh-oh. Buckle your seatbelt. David said, I'm coming to you in the name of the Lord. And this is what's going to happen. Now, I don't know if it was boldness, if it was the anointing of God, or just good old-fashioned swagger. But then he started saying, oh, and by the way, I'm going to take you out. And when I take you out, that stone is going to knock you down and I'm going to kill you. And then once I kill you, I'm going to feed you to the fowl of the air. And then when they eat you, the only thing that's going to be left is your bones. And then we're going to take your, and he just went on and taunting Goliath. Now, whether it was anointing or unction or just trash, there you go, trash talking, good old-fashioned West Virginia swagger is what we're going to do. He said, this is what I'm going to do. And he started prophesying what he's going to do to the enemy. You can only prophesy those things if you know who you believe. If you know the word of God and you're prayed up and you're ready and you're prepared, you can say, I'm going to take you out and this is how I'm going to take you out. And when I take you out, you're going to fall to the ground and then I'm going to kill you. You prophesied of that situation. You say, well, I don't know, Elder. Do you have scripture for that? Mark 11, 23, I'm glad you asked. He shall have whatsoever he saith. Jesus talking about a believer. I can have whatever I say. If I'm in the word of God and I'm quoting the word of God and I'm taking dominion over an enemy, I will have whatsoever I say. And David said, I'm going to do this to you and this is what's going to happen. And let me tell you something. I'm going to skip forward and that's exactly what happened. Number six, two more. Musicians come. Number six, don't back down or say it this way confront when that whistle blew when that bell rang David did he stand back and kind of do the little jerking and kind of jumping up and down and no he didn't the scripture says when he got done talking and when it was time to fight the scripture says he confronted Goliath what's that mean what's it mean what, what did he do how did he confront him when that whistle sound, that bell rang, he took off out of there running towards Goliath. And no doubt while he was running, he was reaching in that bag. He pulled one out. While he's running, he's going right at him. And he starts swinging that sling. He confronted it. Sometimes you can't get victory over things because you're not confronting. Hit it head on. Don't dodge around it. And that's why we keep going around the same mountain because we're just afraid to go, oh, I don't know. Confront it. Lord, I have a problem with this, so I want you to help me with it. Confess your faults. I'm going to be very cautious right here. It says one to another in the scripture. I'd be careful who I confess my faults to. Because some people aren't just believing like they should. So first, go to the Lord and say, Lord, I have a problem with this. I really do. I'm tempted in this area. Would you help me? Sometimes we try to handle it on our own. We just, bless God, I got the Holy Ghost. I I can't do that. I'm a man. I, I just, I'm strong. I need God. I'm not perfect. I got a lot of things in my life that need fixed. 
And there are things in my life that and every man and every woman is tempted in some way, somehow. So don't, don't hide it from God because he knows anyway. Lord, I need help. When that thought comes to your mind, say, Lord Jesus, I rebuke that thought. And Lord, help me to overcome because I don't want to fail you. I want to make it. Ask the Lord for help. Run towards it. Confront it. Go forward. And then once you knock him out, because the scripture says that he sunk in his forehead. The stone sunk in Goliath's forehead, and he fell face forward to the ground. Boom. David kept on running. Because number seven is finish the job. Finish it. And the reason why we keep fighting the same devil sometimes, the same issue sometimes, because we've just knocked him down and we've knocked him out. And then all of a sudden he kind of goes, takes that stone out, and now you made him mad. And he gets back up, so, oh yeah, let's do it again. And then you're back to square one because you didn't finish the job. Don't give room to the devil. Neither give place to the devil, the scripture says. Take him out of your life. Don't let him be a voice in your life. And once you've knocked him down and knocked him out, he, David ran over to him and he jumped up on top of him and he grabbed his sword because he didn't have a sword. He grabbed Goliath's sword and the sword that was meant for David's head became the sword that took off the enemy's head. Here we go again. A miracle for one, destruction for another. It all depends on your decisions. And he jumped up on top of Goliath and he cut his head off. And when that happened, then all the church started shouting. Somebody get on the organ. Let's all shout and dance. Now we're, we're going to run after the enemy. Let's go. Come on, David. And now they took off running and they chased him. And the enemy and the Philistines are running. They're looking over their back. They're, oh, they killed our, our, our champion and we're out. David became king later on because of his faith and fierceness to believe God. And yet he had a tenderness about him. The scripture says that the Lord saw him in the field. And he's watching those ewe lambs that were getting ready to deliver. And he was attentive to them and watched them and made sure they had whatever they needed. He had a fierceness about him to fight the devil. But yet he had a tenderness about him to take care of the things of God. To go to the house of the Lord. To pray. To take care of the people of God and do what God has called him to do. But yet when it was time to fight, he was ready. So I'll give you a rundown real quick as we stand together. Number one, have faith in God. Number two, don't listen to the negative. Number three, rehearse past victories. Number four, be yourself. Number five, go in the name of the Lord and speak the word. Number six, confront it. Number seven, don't forget to finish the job. Now, I said at the outset, in the beginning, that there are some people that I felt like the Lord was having and wanting to get victory over some things. There's an old saying, and this is the fact that you can see the mountain is God's invitation to conquer it. The fact that you can see the giant or the impossibility is God's invitation to you to conquer it. You say, well, Elder, I, I've got some fear. I, I'm not sure. Timothy says, for God hath not given me the spirit of fear. But what did he say? Okay, it's implied here. But he's given me the spirit of power, the spirit of love, and the spirit of a sound mind. I'm standing strong in faith. I'm standing still, or I'm standing strong, so I've got a sound mind. What casts out fear? Love. I've got the spirit of love. What conquers the enemy? Spirit of power. God has given you everything you need. He's not giving you that spirit of fear, but he's giving you the spirit of power, the spirit of love, and the spirit of a sound mind. You can win. And you can win. And I can win. And this church can win. We've got to move forward. 
if you're here this morning and you say, I, I want, I'm tired of fighting Goliath. It's the same Goliath I've had in my life for several years or several months or several days. I'm going to open this altar for you. Because I want you to come and today is going to be different. Lord willing, you're going to apply these steps to overcome the Goliath that's taunting you. I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's fear, sickness, disease, financial, impossibilities, whatever it is. God can help you through and it's God's will for you to go forward. It's God's will for you to conquer this thing and today's the day. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm tired of praying about some things. Hallelujah. I'm tired of praying about some things. I, I'm ready to conquer some things. Has anybody got any Goliaths in this house this morning and say, yes, I'm tired of praying about it. I'm, I'm tired of fighting. I'm, I'm going to conquer Goliath. Is there anybody else? I know there's got to be more than just one. Come on, don't be afraid. Today's the day. You can have victory today. You can conquer Goliath today. You can conquer that gargantuan of a warrior today. You don't have to face him tonight or tomorrow. You can conquer him today and make sure you finish the job and you'll never have to face him again. Now, I need a few believers to come behind those who have come. Those of you who are not going to be the ones who weigh him down and hinder him, but I want you to come in faith. And I'm, I'm going to ask you to lay your hand on them. And I'm going to ask you to start prophesying with them. What do you mean prophesying? This is what we're going to do. We're going to take authority over this problem. We're going to take authority over this sickness. We're going to take authority over this disease. We're going to take authority over this job situation or this family situation or, or this financial issue, whatever it is. We're going to take authority today. And I'm here as a believer to help you to get that Goliath out of your life forever. I need some believers that believe today that Goliath is going to leave your life today forever. It's not coming back. And we're going to believe that. Now, if you believe that, I want you to raise your hands. Today, look at, look at Goliath. I want you to look at him real good today. This is the last time you're going to see him alive. Next time you see him, you're just going to hold his decapitated head in your hand and say, this is, I got the victory over him. He's not coming back. Now, believers, I want you to lay your hands on them. Those who come forward, lay your hand on them. And you begin to pray for them. In the name of Jesus, we come to this situation, this circumstance, in the name of the Lord. The name of the Lord of hosts. In Jesus' name. That's it. Open your mouth. Open your voice. That's right. Talk to the Lord. In the name of Jesus, we take authority over every sickness, over every disease, over every infirmity, every antichrist spirit, every hindering spirit. Come on, I need a few more believers to lay hands on those who are here. Come on. We're not there yet, but I feel it's coming. Come on. We believe the word of the Lord. We're going to take Goliath down today. I'm never going to fight Goliath again after today. I take authority over this in the name of Jesus. Over sickness, over disease. In the name of Jesus. That's it, prophesy. That's why right. I've got victory today. I've got victory today. I've got victory over this Goliath. I've got victory over this mountain. I've got victory over this problem. I've got victory over this sickness. I've got victory over this disease. I've got victory over my finances. I've got victory in the name of Jesus. I prophesy in the name of Jesus. That's it. Open up your mouth and speak the word of God. I don't care what the rest of the world is out to do. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. That's it, that's it. I feel the anointing of the Holy Ghost. I feel something changing in the spirit. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah.
Sever that head right now. I'm going through. Oh, sever that head right now in the name of the Lord. I don't care what the rest of the world says to you. Oh, sever that head. Don't let that go lie. Get back. Oh, yes. I'm going to turn around. God, we go in the name of Jesus. God, we come against that Goliath in the name of Jesus. I'm going through. I'm going through. Praise, kill it in worship, kill it in faith, kill it in power. I don't care what the rest of the world decides to do. Yeah, what the rest of the world decides to do I've made up my